All right, let's shift gears. Let's talk about the brain, okay? The cool thing about the brain is it's the only thing in the universe that can study itself. That's a pretty wild thing. This desk can't study itself. The floor can't study itself. I mean, we don't know that a star or a supernova or black hole can't study itself. But I think it's cool that human brain, specifically the prefrontal cortex, is the only thing in the world that can study itself. And I think that's a pretty cool fact. Okay, let's start off when we talk about our brain, let's get rid of the one myth that kind of has, has can't, just can't seem to die. And it's the 10% myth. The idea that we only use 10% of our brain. If we could tap into that other 90%, we'd be brilliant. We could move things with our mind. We'd never forget. We'd always be relaxed. You ever see the movie Limitless? Dude took a pill and all of a sudden he was genius. Notice the movie didn't say how it could happen. Did he have more synapses? Did he have more myelination? Did he have more neurotransmitters? I don't know. But the idea that we can tap into that hidden 10 per, I mean, the hidden 90% of our brain, think about this. Right now, all over the world, there are brain surgeries going on in various hospitals all over the world. The last thing you want to hear, if you're on an operating table, is a doctor and going to poke you like, holy crap, what's this? Holy, this is undiscovered territory. No, that's not going to happen, especially 90% of your brain. So there is no undiscovered part of the brain. Just like as far as we know, there is no undiscovered continent in the world. Why we have satellite technology? Why is there, you know, or satellites orbiting the world? Like no one's like, oh, what's that island? No one's ever said that. Not recently. So in the brain, it's not like a doctor is going to say, oh, wow, when you're studying the sheep brain, and in a few days, we're going to put you in uh, groups of four or five, you're going to cut open sheep brains. And you're not going to be able to say, whoa, this isn't in the textbook. I mean, if you can find a part of the brain in your sheep dissections that no one's ever studied, you can put your name on it, you can be famous. So the brain is mapped out. There is no 90% of untapped potential. Let's put, that, let's put that myth to rest. Okay? How do we know that? Brain imaging shows that we use all of our brain almost all of our time. We use, I mean, we rephrase it. We use almost all of our brain almost all of the time. It's not like there's a part of your brain that's dormant, that's silent, that's yet to be woken up. And that's an important thing. The brain's a network. It's kind of the butterfly effect. When one neuron fires, others are going to fire. And if others fire, more are going to fire. So your brain, when one thing happens, the rest of your brain is active. Then let's look at evolution. The average person weighs 150 pounds. The brain is 3 pounds. That means the brain is 2% of our body weight. Yet it consumes 20% of our oxygen. We think our butt muscle, our thigh muscle, man, those things are big. They require a lot of oxygenated blood. And they do. But your brain requires more. So Mother Nature, evolution, Charles Darwin or Optimus Prime, whoever made us, is not actually going to allow us to have a big, inefficient organ that consumes a lot of oxygen but doesn't do anything. So we know the whole brain is active most of the time, or all the brain is active most of the time, but some of the time the whole brain's active. As a quick random trivia question, your skin weighs two times as much or three times as much as your brain. So if you take out your brain and put it here, and then if you take your skin, and if you, if you could take your skin off, I would suggest that would be really painful. All right, you might stick to the couch. All right, if you sat down, it's kind of like, ooh, unless you had like vinyl or leather couches, which you'd probably just slide off with no skin. That's kind of gross. But if you did do that, the reality is your skin weighs a lot more, yet consumes less energy. It's an interesting idea of how important, how powerful the brain is, how much energy it demands. Let's talk about how to study the brain. And that is a huge question. Imagine you are the world's most brilliant neurologist. You have brain anatomy down. You have perfected it. How would you break it into a chapter in an introductory psychology class? You only got 30 pages. How are you going to fit everything you know about the brain into 30 pages? That's really hard to do. I mean, the only analogy I can think of for how complex the brain is, is the universe. If you were going to study the universe, if I said, okay, go tonight, your homework, study the universe, where would you start? Would you start at gravity? Light. Would you start at distance? Planets. Solar system? Black holes? Milky Way, where are you going to start? Well, you know what you should probably do is, I got an idea, let's break down. 
let's break down the universe. I'm going to first study planets, then I'm going to study gravity. Maybe I'll study moons, and I'll study, uh, I don't know, meteors. It's kind of like with the brain. You can't study the whole brain at once. We want to reduce it. We're going to study this part, then we're going to study this part. And we did that a little bit last unit with neurons. Oh, endorphins are your pleasure one. Serotonin's your mood one. But we hinted upon the idea, that's kind of foolish. You can't just say, oh, the reason you're happy is because you have more of this chemical. And it's tempting. Hormonally, for instance, we want to reduce love to a hormone called oxytocin. And oxytocin's kind of the rock star of modern, what are called endro endocrine medicine. Rock star of neurology, because that is the love hormone. That's the trust hormone. That's the human connection hormone. And they've done exhaustive studies on prairie voles. Like, why prairie voles? Because they're one of the few mammals, few mammals in the world that mate for life. We're like, oh, they're cute, they're cuddly. And they don't just, you know, do like little rodent sex where they, they hit it and quit it and they're gone. Oh. All right, and, and the guy's like, yeah, I'll call you. And she's like, really? And he's like, no. Sorry, it's not like that at all. They mate, they flirt, he courts her. She doesn't go into heat until he like spends some time nuzzling her, cuddling her. It's, oh, it's so nice. And so we want to find models of this. And so we find out what is interesting about prairie moles. Well, they find out it's this hormone oxytocin. I know I'm simplifying, but the idea is, well, then can you say human love is this chemical? And a lot of scientists have rushed to say, yeah. If you were to look at breastfeeding moms, oxytocin, off the charts. You were to look at people who are in love, oxytocin, off the charts. You were to look at people who just had intercourse, oxytocin, love, love, love. This is what makes people connect. But that's like reducing the, this very complex emotional, cognitive, behavioral, human thing to one molecule, I don't buy it. It's too simple. And this is what we have to guard against when we talk about the brain. We will say this part is responsible for this behavior. But please know that behavior is complex and there's more parts responsible. So if you were the world's best anatomist and you wanted to write a textbook or even a chapter in an introductory textbook on the brain, we're going to be tempted to say, here's the vision part. Here's the hearing part. Here's the feeling part. Here's the memory part. And it does make it easier for students. And when you're going to read your book and you're going to make a chapter outline, it's going to be tempting to make a chart. We're going to put this part here, this part here. But that's really not doing a good service to the complexity of the brain. So we want to be careful not to be total reductionists and say, oh, here's the love part. Here's the anger part. Oh, if you stimulate this part, this will happen. The tempting thing of this video is to say, oh, here's the hand part. Here's the bicep part of the brain. Here's this part of the brain. And could a surgeon, like a puppet master, stimulate part of your brains and control your fingertips and make you do stuff? Could a puppet master control your arm and make you slap five? Sort of. Okay, let's see what we got here. This is completely unethical. My hours are unethical. I don't have time to sit around searching tons of travel sites looking for flights and hotels. Just use Kayak. It compares hundreds of travel sites in seconds. Well, I guess you're the brains of this operation. <laughs> Compare hundreds of travel sites at once. Could that be done? Not to that level, yet. Do we want it done? You say no, maybe. Could it? You know, we'll talk about the interaction again between brain and computer. In order to do that, if you want to be a better athlete and run faster, could you find the run faster part of the brain and then stimulate that? Probably not because there's not a run faster part of the brain. That's a complex behavior. So let's look at how we study the brain. So how do we study the brain? Well, we got two choices. We can either localize slash specialize or we could look at the whole brain. Localization slash reductionism, that's easy. It's much easier because for simple behaviors, for simple reflexes, we can find the blinking part of the brain, the coughing part, perhaps even the breathing part. But where is the sports part of the brain? Hmm. So what are we talking about? It's easy to say, let's localize and find all of the different pieces and put them together. And if we put them all together, we have the whole brain. But let me introduce you to a German word, and the German word is called gestalt. 
So I, so I know you've written it down, but I want you to write it down phonetically. There's an invisible H in there. Write down gestalt with the invisible H. Pronounce gestalt. And here's the definition. It's a pretty cool definition. We're going to talk about Dr. Frankenstein. The definition is this. The whole is more than the sum of its parts. The whole is more than the sum of its parts. One more time for the slow children. The whole, I'm looking at you, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. So let's take Frankenstein, Dr. Frankenstein. And let's take him, advance him 100, 200 years in the future. And you take all of the parts of the body, you take a foot, and you sew it onto an ankle. I'm not just talking, doing a bone graph and roughly stitch together the skin and some nasty looking scar. I'm talking dude is a brilliant vascular surgeon. He is actually suturing together capillaries. He is somehow or another reconstructing neural connections on the micro level. If you were to take all of the parts and if you were to, uh, to make the best body ever, the best functioning body, would it be Bruce Lee? Maybe. You're laughing. The rumor was Bruce Lee could throw five punches in a second. Think of those reflexes. Think of that muscle control. The rumor was Bruce Lee could not only do a handstand going downstairs, he could do a handstand going up the stairs. Walking your hands going up the stairs, that's pretty difficult. Would, would that be it? Would it be Michael Jordan? Would it be Robert Griffin III, praise be his name? What, did, did you just say, oh, oh, it's on. It's on. So here's what I'm saying to you. If you could make a whole human body on an operating table and you have all the parts there, is it a human? No. Something's missing. What is missing? I don't know. That's maybe for philosophers or religious scholars. Medicine can only take us so far. Notice that who you are is more than the sum of all your brain parts. You're more than just your coughing part, your blinking part, your bicep moving part. So what are we talking about? If we want to study part by part, that's easy, but we're missing something. If we want to study the whole brain, it's kind of too complex. But if we don't study the whole brain, we don't see how they interact. One more example of this. I want you to go home and I want you to read. Read something, but watch yourself read. Do you read every letter? Or do you read a whole word? Do you read the whole sentence? When you read, are you reading localization, bit by bit, specialized letters? Are you sounding it out in your brain? No. You're reading the whole sentence. You're getting the whole meaning. That's called holism or gestalt. And that's probably how we should study the brain. A little too complex, a little bit beyond our ability in this class to study the whole brain at once. So we will start piece by piece. But there's a flaw with that, and we're going to get into that later. Let's look at how the brain forms. Well, all of our brains are different. And if the brain accounts for us, what accounts for the differences in human brains? And the answer is, of course, too easy. We're going to slap on a label, oh, genetics. Genetics makes us all different. I mean, it's pretty easy if you think about it this way. Um, if you look at a jockey, a man who rides horses, you know, for the, the big derby races, the Kentucky Derby. Dude is tiny, 90 pounds, maybe he's five feet tall because obviously the less weight the horse has to carry, the faster the horses. I want you to compare that against an NFL lineman. 6'5", nearly 400 pounds. You're like, oh my gosh, genetically, their bodies have inherited completely different instructions. Oh my gosh. But what we're finding out is that's too easy to say. Oh, it's just genetics. Let's look at a little bit of how genetics is going to form and form specifically the brain. Do you think anyone here is born with the same brain? Do we all start out tabula rasa? I mean, if we're born a different skin color, different eye shape, some people are born in or out -y. And if we're going to be racist and prejudiced, I think we should be racist and prejudiced against the Audis. All right, because they make the beach a little bit creepy. <laughs> who, who knows what I'm talking about? You're like, oh, dude, put that away. All right. <laughs> Why would I say that? That's not nice. Somewhere in the back of the class, there's a kid's like, oh. All right. <laughs> So let's do this. Our brain forms in utero due to instructions. And when you hear the word genetics, a lot of us think, oh, that's just how I'm made. Can't change my height. Can't change my eye shape. Or I can't change my hair texture. It's just, that's who I am. I'm not even sure you'd want to, but a lot of people might, whatever, you get the idea. We mistake genetics with predestination, with written in stone. That's how it's got to be. 
and that's not the case. It's not the case prenatally. When that baby's being formed, yeah, the brain is reading genetic instructions. We should form this way. We should form this way. Is that the basis of personality? How your brain's formed? Maybe. But what if mommy has a whole bunch of presence of this chemicals in her body? What if mommy's really stressed? What it will do will alter the instructions with which the brain creates itself. This is true after birth. Are, are the genes we inherit are not written in stone. It's not like we have no choice. Oh, I'm going to be a genius. Oh, I'm going to be an idiot. I'm going to have this personality. I'm going to have that personality. What we, need, what we need to understand is environment affects our genes. So let's look a little deeper at this. First thing we need to talk about is we look, go back to the example of the jockey and the NFL lineman. We're looking at the differences in their body. You know what? That's only 30% of the differences in genes between people. 70% of your genes are expressed in the brain. That gives us an idea of how important the brain is. Who cares how tall someone is? Who cares whether they have a birthmark there? Who cares whether their nose is, looks like Phineas and Ferb? Which one's got the big nose? Ferb's got the big nose? Or is it? Phineas' nose is his face. Okay. He is, all right, that's fine. So who cares physically? The difference between us is the brain. One more time, if you have a crush on someone, and it's not just their physical thing. You're looking at their different parts, like, mm hmm and you're all trying to sneak a little look. Don't it's not see perverts, all right? So <laughs> it's not their physical body. Now, granted, you're not gonna have a tra you're not gonna have a crush on someone who's so physically disformed it looked like someone put nickels in a sock, spun up and hit him in the face repeatedly. <laughs> That's not who you have a crush on. You have a crush on their personality. So let's face it, you have a crush on their brain. I know it's a weird thing. Next time you see someone, I like your brain. <laughs> <laughs> the differences in people are their brain. 70% of the genetic material is expressed in the brain. Body is only 30%. Environmental input, and I hinted upon this, and mental habits. Environmental input and mental habits not only grow neurons through something called neuroplasticity, but they do affect whether some genes are turned on and turned off. And I don't think we have to dip too deep into our imagination. Some of us might have genetic instructions to turn on a disease or a mutation or lose hair or grow this or grow that. But environment and even mental habits and stress can turn on some genes and turn off others. And I think that's powerful. What does that show us? that what we're conceived with isn't our destiny. Genetics is not destiny. Epigenetics is a relatively recent field and it's the study of genetic changes due to non-genetic factors. Hormones, stress, poverty. Can poverty affect behavior? Sure. Can poverty affect brain development? Yes. Can poverty affect genetic expression? Yes. The word is called methylation. Methylation is a process by which genes are turned on and off by proteins. Methylation is a process by which genes are turned on and off in proteins. What does this mean? Well, we're going back to brain development. How does your brain develop? Was Einstein's brain destined to grow a certain way and nothing in the universe could stop it? It was genetically programmed? No. If Einstein's brain grew according to a whole bunch of factors. Clearly genetics is important, but genetics is not written in stone. What other factors could affect our brain development? What other factors, what genetic factors can be turned on and off due to what we think, due to our genetic, due to our environmental factors? I will give anyone this twisty tie turned roughly into a circle shape. All right, I'm out of candy and I don't have any more stickers. Sorry, so I'm, I'm down to what I got. I will give you this twisty tie, but you know what I mean? I don't want this. I, don't, I disagree. How much could you distract yourself in class by making this into different shapes? This is a pretty good prize. So I will give anyone this twisty tie. If you can tell me what an SSRI is. Come on. I see people really working hard. Go ahead. Good, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Here you go. I know, you're pretty happy, right? How quickly until you make it in less than a circle? 
it's not the prize itself, it's the fact she won. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So what does that mean? That clearly means that depression is correlated with lack of serotonin. And if that's genetic, and there, are, there is evidence that depression is genetic, then that would mean that certain populations it's going to be equally distributed all over the world, like other diseases. But that's not the case. Certain societies have less depression than other societies. You're like, well, wait a minute. If it's genetic, then it would be evenly distributed, more or less. Why do some societies have less depression than others? And this is kind of, again, gives evidence. The society, the environment in which you grow up in might allow certain diseases to happen and prevent certain other diseases to happen. In collectivist societies that are non-competitive, they're more cooperative societies, there's not as much depression. So does that mean our society is turning on more genes for depression? We're going to talk about this when we get to abnormal psych. Because here's the question. If medicines are so good, and they are, antidepressant meds, antipsychotic meds, anti-anxiety meds, if these medicines are so good at interfering with diseases, why are more and more people getting sick? The medicines are improving geometrically. But you know what? Unlike bodily diseases that we've more or less cured, we've gotten a handle on, why is the mental health taking off? Why are more, more people getting ill? Is it our society is causing it? And if so, how? Is our society pressure on some level turning on the genes to be mentally ill? Maybe. It's an interesting question. Uh, in our lectures as we go forward, we've got three parts of the brain, three main subsections. And you're like, well, I thought you weren't going to localize. We have to localize because that's how we make sense of this complex thing. We're going to have the lower brain, we're going to have the midbrain, and we're going to have the forebrain. But you know in psychology, everything's going to have multiple labels for this. So we're going to call the lower brain, it's going to be the hindbrain and or the brainstem. Lower brain, hindbrain, and brainstem. And a lot of people are going to call this the primitive part of the brain. But I disagree. I don't think that's very primitive. This is the part that keeps you alive. How can it be primitive if it is the li vital life function? If you, this part of your brain gets damaged, you're dead. You're dead before you even know you're dead. Have you ever seen those bad action movies where bad guy or the hero sneaks up behind someone, grabs their neck and twists, and you hear some crunch, and the dude falls dead? That's the part of the brain you're hurting. Okay. Is it primitive? No, because we're going to find out some of these parts of the brain do amazingly complex things. So you put primitive part of the brain in quotes, that's how people are going to describe it, but there is no such thing as a primitive part of the brain. I'll tell you what, is it time for a video? Yes. I think so. Let's look at what the medulla is not. The medulla is part of your brain stem. Here's what it's not. Now is there anyone here that can tell me why most alligators are abnormally aggressive? I know the answer to this question. Raise your hand. Anybody? Anyone? Yes or you, sir? Mama says that alligators are ornery because they got all them teeth but no toothbrush. <laughs> <laughs> Your mama said alligators are ornery because they got all them teeth and no toothbrush. <laughs> Wow! <laughs> Anybody else? Hey, yes, the user. Alligators are aggressive because of an enlarged medulla oblongata. It's the sector of the brain which controls aggressive behavior. That is correct. The medulla oblongata. But mama said... The medulla oblongata is where anger, jealousy, and aggression come from. Now, is there anybody here who can tell me where happiness comes from? No. Anyone? All right. Let's hear what Mama has to say on the subject. Mama say that happiness is from magic rays of sunshine that come down when you're feeling blue. <laughs> <laughs> well, folks, Mama's wrong again. <laughs> no, Colonel Sanders, you're wrong. Mama's right. <laughs> Is there anyone here who's flirted with the idea of being a lawyer? I see a couple shy hands. 
All right. Any ideas? Flirted with the idea of being a doctor. A couple of alligator arms coming up. Any an idea? Want to be a teacher? Oh. What was that? <laughs> You're, you're looking at my tortured life and you're like, no way, never. All right then, is anyone here who, who kind of wants to be a CIA assassin? All right, someone's like, ooh, I didn't know that was an option. <laughs> Where do I sign up for that? If so, your target is the medulla. It's the base of the brain. It's right where the spinal cord and the brain come together. It's basically the top of your spinal cord. That's the most sensitive part of your body. If we look at half of the brain, where's the medulla? It's going to be the top part of the spinal cord. The medulla is the top part of the spinal cord. Where is the pons? It's going to be the swollen, kind of bumped out part of the top of the spinal cord. The pons and the medulla, for our purposes, complement each other very nicely. They're in charge of vital life functions, relaying those vital life functions to other parts of the brain. And it's automatic. It's unconscious. I double dog dare you right now to think about your breathing. Everyone right now, think about your breathing. So for the next 10 seconds, I want you to determine whether or not you're breathing in through your nose, breathing in through your mouth, and if you cough, how quickly does it take for you to reset your breathing? Okay, now I would like you to forget that. Stop thinking about your breathing. Just let it go back to automatic function of medulla and pons. Don't think about it. Wait for it. And then, oh, I, I almost forgot. Hey, oh, now I'm thinking about it again. So what does this mean? Notice we don't think about your heartbeat. You can hold your breath at double dog area to hold your heart. Flex. No, it doesn't work. You can try. And I think this is important. I think, please don't say this is the primitive part of your brain. Your medulla and your pons are your life. Cerebellum, nickname's called the little brain. It's kind of like a brain within a brain. This thing is brilliant. People they say it's primitive. If you can walk without thinking, there's your cerebellum. Anyone here play musical instrument? All right. When you were first learning, your whole brain, your whole brain was active. You had to like read the sheet music. You had to consciously move your fingers on the piano or the trumpet or I don't know if you have drums. You just randomly hit something really hard. I don't know. All right. Playing drums, I don't imagine, can be that difficult. Does anyone here play drums? Is it really hard? You just hit something. So you need a lot of coordination. You need to be able to use one hand. That's your cerebellum. She said you need a lot of coordination. You need to be able to use one hand or the other. When you're first learning something, your whole brain's active. You've got to coordinate what you hear, what your body's trying to do, reading the music, keeping up with the band. But now, as many of you all have progressed in your musical career, you can do stuff without thinking about it. You can do stuff unconsciously, even really demanding physical tasks. And this is because of your cerebellum. It deals with muscle coordination and practiced motor movements. Notice how easily you write. I don't think anyone here is like, oh, wait, how do I make that letter? You do it automatically. You do it easily. I don't think anyone here, when you, when you have to walk, if you have to think about walking, that's a problem. It means you haven't practiced a while. Now, if you're really kind of mean, and I'm not saying I've done this, <laughs> all right, maybe, um, what you do is you take a 14-month-old or a 13-month-old, and at that magical moment, they're taking their first unsteady step. And if you could hook them up to an MRI, fMRI, their whole brain is lighting up. It takes every bit of concentration, balance, moving muscles. They've never done this before. They're really concentrating. So right when that little kid is about to take the step, you say, hey, and they look and they fall. Why? <laughs> it's not right. Why would you do that? If you, because they cannot think, we're going to get to the consciousness unit. But you basically can't think of two things at the same time. So your cerebellum, for lack of a better word, is the butler of your brain. It does all the stuff you don't want to consciously think about. So as we go through your cerebellum, practice motor movements, we're also going to know it's called procedural memory. As we look at the cerebellum, I have three Bs. Cerebellum. Notice in the English language, you can only put an emphasis on every other syllable. Cerebellum. If you don't believe me, I'd like you to try and say the word cerebellum. It doesn't sound right. Cerebellum. It's like putting the wrong emphasis on the syllable. It doesn't make sense. So here's what we're going to do. Okay? I want you to notice on cerebellum, first and third syllables. Cerebellum. So I got, I got B's. Okay? I should even have a fourth B. Okay, why? Because we know it does balance. And it hangs off the back of the brain. And it kind of looks like a butt. 
Okay, so what do we have? We have butt back balance cerebellum. Will that help you remember? I don't know. But I know the worst way to try to remember cerebellum butt back balance is to try to memorize a complex definition in your textbook or something you find online. Find the definition, simplify it, shorten it, make it your own.